of Freddie and Fannie were giant government-sponsored enterprises that would never have existed in a free market. When they went broke, they were leveraged to thousand to one. They had a thousand dollars in debt for every dollar in equity, and they owed five trillion dollars. Uh, now, you as a U.S. taxpayer owe five trillion dollars. Congratulations. Um, uh, very interesting. The politics played a huge role in, in Freddie and, and Fannie um, in, in this sense that I was personally on a committee of the Financial Services Roundtable for nine years trying to do something about Freddie and Fannie. And we could run the numbers, and if you ran the numbers, it was mathematically certain they were going broke. And we met with Congress on numerous occasions, and Congress absolutely refused to do anything about Freddie and Fannie for two basic reasons. One, affordable housing that had kind of a religious belief, or like, you know, housing's a good thing. So it was almost a, almost a religious kind of view of affordable housing. And secondly, Freddie and Fannie were huge political contributors. They were one of the largest contributors to the Republican Party, and I believe they were the largest contributors to the Democratic Party. So Congress refused to do uh, anything about Freddie and Fannie, even though the numbers were overwhelming if they were going broke. We could not have had the housing bubble uh, and the affordable housing subprime market without, uh, without Freddie and Fannie. So here's what happened. The Federal Reserve printed too much money. That created a bubble. It ended up in housing because of Freddie and Fannie, and that's the correction process we've been going through. Um, let me give you a little background because to help you give some more context and some other issues. Uh, banks exist because they create the ability of the economy to what's called pool liquidity and interest rate risk. And that allows the economy to make longer term investments and increases the productivity of the economic system. I'll give you a simple example. Maybe somebody wants to build a residential subdivision uh, and they want to you know, build the lots. They've got to put it in the streets and the water and the sewer. Uh, and maybe it's, they're going to borrow about $25 million to do that. And it's going to take them about five years to build the lots and sell the lots. Well, it's too small to go to the capital markets, and yet it might be too big for an individual to invest in. A bank can make that kind of investment uh, because the bank can create liquidity from borrowing from multiple people, and it can, it can spread out its risk by doing many other types of investments so it's not, it's not investing in one project. There are no he healthy economic systems that don't have healthy banking systems. Unfortunately, however, by their nature, banks that are solvent have more assets and liabilities, but they're not necessarily liquid. They don't always have all the money in the bank. We got a really big red flag when Bear Stearns uh, went broke uh, because for the first time in many years, uh, here's a large company that on the surface was solvent, they had more assets and liabilities, but wasn't liquid, wasn't liquid. Uh, banks are leveraged about 10 to 1. That means they have about $10 in debt for every dollar in equity. Investment banks are leveraged about 30 to 1. That's why investment banks went down in many cases much faster than commercial banks. The Federal Reserve has actually encouraged banks to leverage more because if you owe a lot of money like the U.S. government, you are very encouraged to have a little bit of inflation because you can pay back with cheaper dollars. Um, and so you want banks, to, and the way you execute through the inflation is actually encourage the leverage in the banking system. The SEC actually created a process that encouraged investment banks to leverage more. You may remember uh, Elliot Spitzer, the New York governor, that attacked the investment banking model, where investment banks had traditionally taken risks with other people's money. They, they, they were limited in how they could do that under the new rules. And so what they did was start taking risks with their own money, and, and they raised their, their, their leverage ratios. They become more leverage. Before there was a Federal Reserve, banks were leveraged about one to one. Even conservative banks had to leverage to be competitive. Um, all right, how did the residential real estate markets contribute to the financial crisis? Interesting enough, ultimately house prices are determined by affordability. If you can't afford a house, you can't buy it. If you look at the peak of the residential real estate cycle, house prices in the U.S. were about 30 percent too high. Uh, based on affordability. Now that varied a lot by market. In Southern California, they may have been 60% uh, too high. In Winston-Salem, North Carolina, where I live, maybe they were 10 or 15% too high. But on average, they were about 30% too high. Here's the bad news. House prices initially fell about 20%. Most of the financing for houses came from financial institutions. When that when the prices fell 20%, that destroyed about $500 billion worth of capital in the financial services industry. Remember, banks are leveraged 10 to 1, investment banks 30 to 1, let's just use 10 to 1. If you destroy $500 billion in capital, you destroy $5 trillion worth of liquidity, i.e. $5 trillion worth of lending capacity. Um, 
Banks scrambled trying to get some more capital. Maybe they raised about $200 billion in capital, but that still left a $3 trillion liquidity shortfall, $3 trillion less in lending capacity, including the capacity of banks to lend to each other. Um, and then there was in the market fear of a greater decline because prices had only fallen 20%. They had another 10% to go. That could destroy, could destroy another trillion dollars uh, in, in lending capacity because it would destroy $100 billion in capital. And the market started getting tight. They started getting upset. And then a very interesting event happened, one that's not, not been discussed enough. The uh, FDIC and the Treasury and the Federal Reserve made a very interesting decision. When Washington Mutual, a large uh, thrift institution headquartered on the West Coast, failed, they made a decision to cover the uninsured depositors. Well, that was a surprise to the marketplace because tr traditionally when a big bank fails, the insured depositors get paid, but the uninsured depositors take a haircut. They lose part, part of their money. Well, what that meant is the debt holders of Washington Mutual got a lot less money than they expected. They knew they were going to lose money, but, but they, they thought they were going to be on kind of an equal status with the uninsured depositors, so they got a lot less money. The market then said, well, geez, we have no legal rights in relation to the Federal Reserve or the FDIC, and the capital markets closed for banks. They just shut. BB&T had actually been in the market shortly before this. We'd had a successful uh, capital issue. It was a tough market, but we, we could issue capital. After this, all banks were frozen out of the market. Unfortunately, Housing was overbuilt in other countries, and foreign intermediaries were investing very heavily in the U.S. housing market, which took this housing crisis uh, international. Um, how, how did the residential real estate market so significantly impact the capital markets? This is an interesting phenomenon. You may remember when the financial crisis started, the most focus was on subprime uh, uh, lending. Well, the interesting thing is the subprime loan market is nowhere near big enough to upset the whole U.S. capital markets. But there was an interesting phenomenon that happened. All these subprime loans that had been sold into the capital markets had been uh, underwritten in a certain sense, rated by Standard & Poor's, Moody's, and Fitch. Standard & Poor's, Moody's, and Fitch are special agencies. They only exist through a, a, a government sanction to the SEC. They're the only people that can be in this business. They're, they're responsible for rating uh, financial instruments. Well, they had done a terrible job in rating these subprime instruments. And not, I don't mean that they had rated them A's and they were B's. They had rated them A's and they were D minuses. That was a really big <laughs> rating mistake. The markets then quickly said, well, if, if Standard Poor's, Moody's, and Fitch, which are these government-sanctioned agencies, have done such a terrible job of rating subprime, maybe they misrated all kind of financial instruments. And the market lost confidence in the rating system. And that became very contagious. To give you an example of an area you would have never expected, it's called the auction rate municipal bond market. Auction rate municipal bond market primarily focuses on providing financing for tax-free entities typically that don't have taxing authorities, like a university, like a hospital, like a, an airport authority, a bridge authority. A lot of these entities had done long-term projects like building a, a new wing to the hospital, either using variable rate financing or, or short-term financing that they rolled over. And, and in doing this, the way they, they got their financing, they would go to two big insurance companies called AMBAC and MBIA, who would then rate uh, their, uh, their risk. Now, the market pretty soon figured out that AMBAC and MBIA were guaranteeing a lot of uh, mortgage debt, and therefore they were in financial trouble, even though Standard Poor's and Moody's and Fitch were, were still rating them AAA. Uh, so they had no confidence in the, in the insurance companies and no confidence in the rating system. And if you're sitting in Hong Kong, how in the world do you figure out whether the hospital in Emporia, Virginia is in good financial state, sh shape or not? So, no confidence in the rating system, no confidence in the insurance policies, and a lot of these entities, these, these local entities, couldn't get financing or their rates went off the chart. 